Hi, uh, welcome to the first video in a series on number theory, uh, elementary number theory. So this is meant to be an introduction uh, to the subject, but also a sort of an introduction to mathematics in general, in the sense that it's going to be an introduction to writing proofs. So a lot of people have uh, the the idea that mathematics is all about solving equations and you're always trying to solve specific problems but more generally mathematicians are are typically trying to justify logical ideas rather than solve specific problems uh, we do solve specific problems as well but so one one clear example i can give you for instance is the pythagorean theorem which says that if I have a right angle triangle whose base is length B, the height is length A, and the hypotenuse has length C, then A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Okay, so some of you may be seen this before, but how do we know this is true? Have we gone out and measured every single possible triangle? Well, no, there's no way we could do that. There's infinitely many choices for the different lengths of the sides of a right angle triangle. So how could we possibly know that this equation will always hold for any right angle triangle? Well, this is where the idea of mathematical proof comes in. We need some sort of airtight logical reasoning that allows us to be completely confident that no matter what right angle triangle we have, this identity will hold. So that's the sort of thing that I mean when I say proof. Okay, so on to our course, number theory. I'm going to be following the book Elementary Number Theory by Underwood Dudley. If you're interested in this book, uh, whether you're a, a lay person or, or, say, an undergrad, I highly recommend it. It is only $20, about as cheap as math books get. It is full of tons of great information. It's also pretty funny. There's a, He likes to make jokes throughout the book here and there. And, uh, of course, you know, some of you uh, C-savvy pirates may be able to smuggle it onto your laptop, but really, at $20 for a book, you, you can't go wrong. Uh, definitely recommend buying this. So, what is number theory about? Well... Of course, there's many different kinds of numbers, right? There's things like irrational numbers, like the square root of 2, or pi, negative 3, say it is an integer, we could have fractions like 2 over 7. So number theory is mostly concerned with integers. So sometimes we write this set with a funny little z, and... This is the numbers negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 dot. So, and keeps going lower and higher. So basically just all the whole numbers, the negative whole numbers, and 0 altogether. And one of the main things we're interested in is divisibility. So which numbers divide other numbers? And while this seems like a totally, completely simple concept, uh, essentially this idea of divisibility, for example, underlies a lot of modern cryptography. It's all about prime numbers and how they relate to each other and how different numbers divide each other. So it's, it's all done with, with basic properties of divisibility. Uh, other things, it, uh, it can help us solve some more complicated problems. So the one of the most famous problems in number theory is Fermat's last theorem. So this says that uh, x to the power of n, some integer, plus y to the power of n equal to z to the power of the n. Uh, so one example would be, say, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, right? So that looks just like the Pythagorean theorem up here. So if I did have just if n was equal to 2, uh, one thing we're, we're interested in, since we're talking about integers, it'd be nice, of course, I could find tons of solutions to this equation if I'm using uh, weirder numbers, say say real numbers, irrational numbers, but I want to I wanna try and find nice solutions in integers. 
So if n is equal to 2, I just get the Pythagorean theorem. And for instance, uh, I could take 3 squared plus 4 squared. So that's going to be 9 plus 16. That's equal to 25. And 25 is 5 squared. Right? So if I took, uh, if n was equal to 2 down here, x was equal to 3, y was equal to 4, and z was equal to 5, uh, that would give me a solution to this equation. But Fermat's last theorem says that if x, y, and z, none of those are equal to 0, and if n is at least 3, then the theorem says that there are no integer solutions. And so this was a pretty big deal when it was finally proved because it took about 350 years for mathematicians to crack this one. So that's another type of example that a number theorist uh, of a problem a number theorist might be interested in. And it's something that this concept of divisibility, uh, perhaps later in this course we'll see, we won't do the full proof because of course it's very uh, complicated, but Perhaps uh, in some cases for small values of n, we can see how these divisibility properties will help us solve this. So uh, without further ado, why don't we formally introduce the idea of divisibility? Let's give this a proper definition. So in mathematics, we like to be concise, right? We have these sort of vague ideas of, you know, I know that 3 divides 6, right? Because... 6 divided by 3 is a nice number. But I want to be more precise than just saying, oh, it's a nice number. 3 divides 6 because it equals a, a whole number. That's close, but it'd be nice if I could really pin down a, a thorough definition, and even better if I can involve equations in that definition, because equations are something tangible that we can manipulate and get our hands on, and that's, that's going to be good to work with. So, so let's divine, uh, define divisibility. So we say an integer a divides b, which is also an integer, if there is an integer c such that a times c is equal to b. And we're going to write this uh, sort of shorthand way to say a divides b will be a bar b. So just as a check to make sure this makes sense with our original definition, right? Up here I'm saying that 3 bar 6, right? 3 divides 6. And so by this definition, this says, oh, I need to find some integer. So 3 is playing the role of a, 6 is playing the role of b. It says I need to find some integer so that 3 times c is equal to 6. And yeah, sure enough, we already know 2 is what's going to do the job, right? 3 times 2 is equal to 6. So this is just formalizing our intuitive definition of what it means for one integer to divide another integer. So as an expression of, I guess, the power of defining things formally, why don't we prove our first theorem? Uh, actually, in, uh, in the book, he calls this a lemma. So lemma is just another word for a theorem or established fact that mathematicians use, but uh, theorems typically reserved for maybe a bigger, more important result, whereas a lemma is typically maybe a smaller, less significant thing, but a useful stepping stone to get towards a bigger result. So our lemma is going to say that if we have some integer a, uh, oh, sorry, just going to rewrite this. If we have some integer d that divides an integer a, and 
and that same d also happens to divide another integer b, then d will also divide a plus b. Now this may not be too surprising to you. Of course, if you've basically taken any class in say junior high, you've used this fact all the time with fractions. It wasn't phrased in this formal type of setting, but this is you know basically just something about adding fractions that have the same denominator, essentially. But you were just told that was a rule that you could use, right? No one ever showed you explicitly that you can always be able to do this. You were just told, oh, we can always do this. So now we're actually going to see why we can always do this. Following right from our definition of divisibility, we're going to show that yes, it's the case that we can always we can always use this rule. We're going we're gonna to establish that this rule is definitely true for all integers. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, we're saying here is that if we start off with these numbers d, a, and b, then this result will happen, right? So we already know, we're, we're assuming that we have a number d, uh, which divides some number a, and uh, d also divides b. So by this definition up here, we have numbers, by this definition up here, we have integers c and e such that d times c is equal to a and d times e is equal to b. Right, that's just our definition up here, right? Because d divides a by the definition of what that even means, it says I can find some other number, call it c, so that d times c is equal to a. And I can find, uh, because d divides b, I can find some number, let's just call it e, so that d times e is equal to b. Okay. So this is something we are, we're assuming that we have already, and we want to show that D also divides A plus B. So we want to show that this definition is satisfied. Well, let's look at this thing right here, A plus B. I want to figure out how, how we can show D can divide it. So we've got this thing A plus B, and we have these expressions over here, which gives us a different way to write A and a different way to write B. So why don't we try looking at a plus b from a different perspective? See if that sheds any light on the situation. So what I can do here, because d times c is equal to a, I can just replace a in this equation with d times c. And because d times e is equal to b, I can just replace b in this expression with d times e. But now look, I've got a common factor of d in both of these terms. So I can factor that out in front, and I get d times c plus e. So let's take a look at this. a plus b is equal to d times c plus e. Now remember, we wanted to show that d divides a plus b. Well, our definition said that that meant we had to find some number so that d times some number was equal to a plus b. But that's what we just did. We just found a number so that when we multiply that number by d, we get a plus b. So we've just completed our proof now that d actually does divide a plus b. And sometimes when mathematicians finish a proof, we just put a little box at the end to know that we're done. It's called a Halmosh gravestone, named after the mathematician Paul Halmosh. And I think that's just going to be uh, just uh, about going to, that's just about going to do it for us for today, right? We talked about basics of number theory, had our first definition, proved our first lemma. 
so the next time we're going to talk about uh, greatest common divisors and prove uh, theorem one from Dudley's book. Uh, if you have any suggestions or questions, um, any ideas for future videos, please leave something in the comments. And have a good day.